Welcome to installment number six of Alan Roger Curry's Black Week. <laughs> That's what I'm lightheartedly calling it. Black Week. Because almost all of my discussions beginning with last Wednesday have dealt with issues that black men have with black women. Now, I don't know how many of my followers caught. Well, first of all, I got a Patreon exclusive video, a Patreon exclusive live stream at four o'clock today, four o'clock Eastern. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, man, if you can make it, I got a Patreon exclusive live stream at four o'clock PM Eastern. But yeah, man, if y'all been keeping up with the goings on, not only on my own channel, I've actually only done one video on my own channel before today that's dealt with black issues, but I've done what? Including yesterday, I've done four. I was involved in four interviews and discussions that had to deal with black men versus black women issues. So I have to offer a lighthearted apology to my non-black uh my non-black video, I mean, my non-black listeners, supporters, Patreon subscribers. Because I don't like to talk about all this, this black shit, man. Because here's the thing about Alan Roger Curry. I am not a black man's dating coach. Let me repeat that. Alan Roger Curry is not a black man's dating coach. I am a men's dating coach who happens to be black. Big distinction. I am not a black man's dating coach. I am a men's dating coach who happens to be black. Now, I had a powerful interview with O'Shea Duke Jackson yesterday, the editor-in-chief of the Negro Manosphere. It was entitled, Are Black Women Unfairly Criticized? Are black women unfairly criticized? And to answer that question directly, I believe that there are a, a, a significant percentage of black women that are unfairly criticized and stereotyped because of you black men, you bitter, resentful black men. I'm going to issue the challenge that I issued, I issued twice, twice. Last year, I'm going to issue this challenge one more time, third time. They say third time is a charm. This will be my third time issuing this challenge. While I was being interviewed by O'Shea Duke Jackson, occasionally I would pay attention to what, what was being said about the interview and about me in the, in the chat room. And once again, you had guys making this statement along the lines of, yeah, man, I used to think Alan Roger Curry was cool, man, but since he came on YouTube, he's different. He's changed. I heard that a lot last year. I haven't heard it as much in 2018 as I did in 2017. But there's still a few guys who, who make comments along those lines. Like, yeah, man, you know, I used to think Alan Roger Curry was cool. But yeah, man, he's different than I thought he was, man. He's changed. And the more specific criticism has been that since I've come to YouTube, that I'm more harsh on men. I'm harsher in my criticisms of men than I am in my criticisms of women. And even more specifically, that I'm harsher in my criticisms of black men than I am in my criticisms of black women. And y'all know what I'm about to say right here to kick things off. Insert dog face here. I'm going to say for the, the, the millionth time, anybody who's saying that, I would say two things. Anybody who's, who's, who, who has levied that criticism against me, you ain't read none of my books or listened to none of my audio books. I guarantee you, you have it. And you didn't listen to any of my episodes of Blog Talk Radio. When I was on Blog Talk Radio for nine years. I guarantee you, if you genuinely feel that way, if you genuinely feel like Alan Roger Curry 
has changed since he came to YouTube compared to how I was before I was on YouTube and that I'm now all of a sudden harsher in my criticisms and admonishments of men in general and I'm harsher in my criticisms and admonishments of black men in particular then that tells me one of two things. That tells me that you've never listened to my, my episodes of my blog talk radio show and tells me that you've never listened to my uh, any of my audio books or you've never read any of my books. Because I've said this before. If you read Mo One, my original book, Mo One, Mo One was an admonishment of men. See, a lot of guys looked at Mo One as, as just specifically a self-help book or a dating advice book. And in many ways, it was both of those. But the, the, the one aspect of Mo One that a lot of people overlook, my original Mo One, my first ebook version came out in 1999, my first paperback version came out in 2006. Mo One was an admonishment of men. Specifically, it was an admonishment of men who were liars, manipulators, cheaters and adulterers and in general just verbal cowards that's what mo one was so in addition to it being a self-help book and in addition to it being a general dating advice book mo one was an a a, a harsh admonishment of men that book again that book was an admonishment of men who were liars men who are manipulators, men who are cheaters and adulterers, and men who in general are verbal cowards. That's what Mo, that's the main reason I wrote Mo One. That's one of the main reasons I wrote Mo One was to call out those types of men. So for those who, who believe that I didn't start harshly admonish, admonishing men until I got to YouTube, again, you ain't read none of my books. You ain't listened to none of my audio books. And you didn't listen, and, and even beyond that, you didn't listen to none of my uh, episodes of blog, my blog talk radio show called Up Front and Straightforward with Alan Roger Curry. Man, I admonish guys all the time on my show, uh, Up Front and Straightforward. I admonish guys all the time on my on my blog talk radio show. I admonish men probably five times as much as I did women. I admonish men five times as much as I did women on my blog talk radio show. Another book, Who Say It Again? Who Say It Again? That's another book that I would say is a self-help book. That's the book where I emphasize teaching men how to improve their erotic, dirty talk skills and their verbal seduction skills. But I spent at least two chapters in that book admonishing men. The types of men I admonish in Who Say It Again is men who are hypocrites, sexual hypocrites, Men who are highly judgmental, i.e. very quick to call women sluts and whores, and men who are indiscreet. Men who are indiscreet. In other words, they like to tell all their business to their male friends about who they fucked and how they fucked them. That's the three types of men I admonish and who said again. I admonish, again, I admonish guys who are sexual, what I mean by sexual hypocrites, guys who are promiscuous themselves, but they're quick to criticize women's promiscuity. Guys who want to sow their wild oats when they're young and then find a good girl to marry when they get to their 30s and 40s, but they criticize women for doing the same thing. Guys who want to fuck another man's wife, sister, daughter, niece, but they don't want no man hitting on their own wife, sister, daughter, or niece. That's hypocritical. I go in on motherfuckers who are hypocritical in my book, Who Said Again. So again, man, for all you guys talking about Alan, didn't, he wasn't this harsh before he came to YouTube. Bullshit. 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 Again, you ain't read none of my books. And you ain't listened to none of my audio books. Even the possibility of sex. Possibility of sex is probably my number one book where I'm the most critical of women's behavior. That's the number one book where I'm the most critical of women's behavior. 
But if you really read that book or listen to the audiobook version, I'm even, even a, at least a small part of that book is an admonishment of men. The main type of man I'm admonishing in, uh, in the possibility of sex is men who believe that being indirect is more effective than being direct. That's the type of guy I, criti I criticize and admonish in that book is guys who believe that it is better to be indirect when it comes to trying to get a woman in bed than it is to be direct. Because the only way you can open a door for women who are manipulative time wasters is if you are indirect, motherfucker. If you're direct, you ain't going to have no problems with manipulative time wasters. You're not. I guarantee you won't. The only men who have problems with manipulative time wasters are men who are indirect. So, again, that's the challenge I'm going to issue to you. Name one thing that about my beliefs, my attitudes, my thoughts, and my general opinions I want somebody in my comment section. Again, I issued this challenge twice last year, and this will be my third time issuing this challenge. Name something about my beliefs, my attitudes, my thoughts, and general opinions that I've expressed in one or more of my YouTube videos that's far different than something I've expressed in my, my eBooks, my paperbacks, my audiobooks, or my episodes of my old blog talk radio show. Now, in my books, I don't go in specifically on black men. So somebody could make that argument. I don't go in specifically on black men in my books, but I go in on men in general in my books. But on my blog talk radio show, there was at least two or three times I went in on black men specifically. I remember one episode I remember specifically was, I want to say it was fall of 2015. Fall of 2015, I remember I would start my shows on Blog Talk Radio just talking about what's going on in my life, things in the news and that type of thing, feedback from my listeners. I remember one show I did in fall of 2000, I think it was either October or November 2015. If I find a specific episode, I'll put it in the comment section. But um, some brother had written me back in October or November of 2015. He said, hey, Alan, man, I love your blog talk radio show, but I have one minor criticism. Man, you never talk about these no good black bitches out here, man. I would love to hear you do one episode where you just go in on these no good black bitches out here. Man, I let that motherfucker have it on my blog talk radio show. I let that motherfucker have it on my blog talk radio show. I basically told my listening audience, I ain't going to ever do no show where I do some stupid shit like that. I ain't going to ever do no show where I do some stupid shit like that. O'Shea was interviewing me yesterday on his channel, and somebody in the chat room said, it's obvious that Alan Roger Curry, because he's light skinned, because he's light skinned, good looking, and has generally had success with women, it's obvious he cannot relate to the everyday normal black man, the challenges of the, the everyday normal black man. Insert dog face here. First of all, that is so it's so ridiculous it's laughable. I can't even get mad at that because it just makes me laugh. When people bring up this whole thing, now I know you nine black people are like, what is this whole light skin thing about? <laughs> I mean, I thought all you black people were just black. I mean, what, what is, is there different shades of black? I mean, what is this whole light skin versus? Yeah, man, if, if for you non-black people within the black community, there's some guys who believe that guys who are considered light brown, like myself, I'm what's called 
caramel colored or light brown that they have an easier time being romantically and sexually successful with women than guys who are really, really dark skinned. Same with black women. There's a lot of dark skinned black women who believe that light skinned black women have an easier time attracting black men than darker skinned black women do, which is bullshit. Is bullshit on both ends. I know some light-skinned black women that are not attractive. And I know some dark-skinned black women that are absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. Ain't got nothing to do with the shade. Shoo. Attractive is attractive. Attractive is attractive. Shoot, I've dated a lot of dark... I've dated women all over the spectrum. I've dated black women in my life that were jet black. And I've dated black women that were light. So light they could almost be white. And everything in between. But for those guys who think being light-skinned is the key to my success, I'm going to put a picture, and I hope my frat brother doesn't mind, but I'm going to put a picture of three of my frat fraternity brothers. Three of my fraternity brothers. Look at the picture. If I can find it, it should be there. If you're looking at it, it should be there. There's that that the picture you're looking at right now is a picture of three of my fraternity brothers from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Now, are any of those three fraternity brothers light skinned? Do you see any light skinned brothers in that picture? No. But guess what? All three of those frat brothers of mine were very successful with black women. Let me repeat that. All three of those black men you see in that picture that are my frat brothers were very successful with women, particularly the brother who's on the left, the tallest of the three. His name is Daryl. We used to call him Chap. Chap was probably one of the top five ladies' men and womanizers in my fraternity when I was in college. And as you can see, he's jet black. But he was he was probably if there was a if I was to do a ranking in my fraternity when I was in college of the guys who were the, the top ladies, men, and womanizers, Chap, the brother on the far left, he was probably in the top five ladies, men, womanizers on the campus of Indiana University. He used to he used to pull women left and right. He used to fuck all kinds of badass bitches. And as you can see, he ain't light skinned. He's jet black. The brother on the far right is another brother. We call him J Mac. He was actually after me. He wasn't on campus with me. He was actually on campus a few years after I left. But I still knew his reputation. He was a top notch ladies' man. He was a top notch ladies' man. And the brother in the middle, we used to call him Flea. He wasn't so much a womanizer. He wasn't really into womanizing. He always had like a steady girlfriend. He was more into having a steady girlfriend. But he's like married to a beautiful black woman right now. He got a beautiful daughter. So he wasn't into the womanizing. He was more into like having a serious girlfriend. But all three of those brothers were successful and none of them are light skinned. So y'all can miss me with this Alan Roger Curry is successful with women because he's a light-skinned brother. That is the most real. Again, I don't even get mad at that criticism as much as I would say it makes me laugh. It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Excuse me. But as far as that criticism that Second thing was, uh, yeah, first one was light skin, good looking. I don't even talk about the whole good looking thing, man. That's again, man. I've known I've known men in general, and particularly black men, who are what most people call average looking that have been successful with women. So anybody who thinks being successful with women is solely about looks, you're sadly mistaken. Now I always offer this disclaimer though. 
looks are always going to play a factor to some degree. Looks are always going to play a factor to some degree. I've always said a woman has the, there has to be something about you that a woman finds physically attractive. It could be just one specific thing like the color of your eyes or the shape of your head or the fact that you got a muscular chest or you got a big ass dick or whatever it may be. But there got to be something about you physically that attracts women. I mean, if there's just literally nothing about you physically that women find physically appealing, then yeah, you're going to have some problems. I won't deny that. You're going to have some issues. Burp number two. Yeah, and about this assessment, Alan Roger Curry can't relate to the everyday normal brother. First of all, what the fuck does that even mean? Seriously, what the fuck does that even mean? On a real tip, what does that even mean? You know what I can't relate to? Men who are powerless. Men who feel powerless. Men who feel like victims. And particularly black men who feel powerless and feel like victims. That's who I can't relate to. That's the only type of man I can't relate to. It's men who are always concentrating on factors in their life that are out of their control, like other people's behavior. Other people's behavior is out of your control, man. Why are you worrying about other people's behavior? Why are you worrying about other people's choices and decisions? Why are you worried about anything to do with other people's lives instead of concentrating on your own life and what you need to do different and do better? Huh? So yeah, you're right. There is some, there is some men, and particularly some black men I can't relate to, and that's men who feel totally powerless. If you are if you have what I refer to as a victim mentality, woe is me mentality, you always like to engage in pity parties, I can't relate to you and I ain't going to empathize with you. Because I don't allow my clients to maintain those type of mentalities. When I work with my clients, I don't allow them to maintain those type of attitudes and shit. Those type of mindsets. That's weak. That's weak. That's not that's unmanly to me. That's unmanly to me. Oh, and then another, another thing I heard some guy say. And I've, I've seen this in a few people's comment section. Not so much my own comment section, but the comment section of other people's videos. Guys, guys were in the chat room when O'Shea was interviewing me yesterday saying, well, Alan, you got to understand, Alan's 55 years old, so he doesn't understand the type of black female fuckery that's going on in the 21st century. Because, see, there, were no, there was no black female fuckery in the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s. So that's why he feels the way he does. Because... Back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you didn't have black men whining and complaining about black women the way you do now in the 21st century. Insert dog face again. Man. You guys are so clueless, man. Some of you young brothers are so clueless. For any young brother who made that statement, man, you are you don't have you don't have a clue. I'm a I'm a loan you a dollar so you could go to the dollar store and buy yourself a clue. If you honestly think that no black men were whining and complaining when I was young, you are delusional. I just mentioned about when I was a college student on the campus of Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. We had a small percentage of brothers that used to always complain about the behavior of sisters. Are you serious? And I immediately, I never hung around them because once they showed that side to me, I would immediately disassociate myself from them. And I would say probably 95% of my frat brothers did. Because see, one thing I'll say about my fraternity brothers, 
the members of Kappa Alpha Psi, man, we didn't do that shit in our, in our Kappa house, man. Brothers didn't sit around whining and complaining about women, man. If anything, women on campus was always whining and complaining about our behavior. We didn't whine and complain about their behavior. They were whining and complaining about our behavior. I never whined and complained about black women when I was in college. And I would say again, probably 95% of my frat brothers, they didn't whine and complain about the behavior of black women because they was too busy, they were too busy fucking them and dating them. They didn't whine about them. The main brothers who you who would be complaining about sisters when I was in college was the brothers who would come to parties and they would go into a little corner and just stand there all night. They would never ask a woman to dance. You would never see them talking to any women. They would just stay in like this one corner of the party for the whole fucking night. It's just like I was being interviewed by another brother yesterday named Brother Xavier. And he brought this up, and I totally agree with him. He said, Alan, I find that there's mainly three brothers, types of brothers, that do the most complaining about women, black women. Three types of brothers. Brothers who've been rejected a lot, rejected and ignored a lot by women. Brothers who have not even been rejected because they're too afraid to approach women and initiate a conversation with them to be rejected. In other words, they're verbal cowards. And then third, he said, is men that don't have no mouthpiece. <laughs> they don't have no mouthpiece. They don't have no verbal communication skills. They don't have no conversation skills. They don't have any type of personality, any type of charisma. And I generally agree with him, man. Not only would I apply that to black men, I would apply that to men in general. I would apply that to men in general who have a lot of bitterness and resentment towards women. It's usually men who have been rejected and or ignored a lot by women. Men who are too afraid to approach women to initiate a conversation with them. They're basically verbal coward types. And men who might have enough confidence to talk to women, but once they do get the conversation going, they don't, they, their, their verbal communication skills, their conversation skills, their overall social skills are so poor and ineffective that they're, they, they can't create any type of romantic or sexual chemistry with women. Now, the good news is at least two of those three categories are men I help and have helped. I help the, the guys in the, the latter two categories. I help men who are verbal cowards. That's the main thing I do is I help men overcome being a verbal coward. That's the number one thing I do. The second thing I do is I help men improve their overall social skills and more specifically, their conversation skills and verbal communication skills. Hold that thought. Okay, I'm back. Um... Excuse me. <laughs> it's funny when I hear those silent burps. I just burped like three times in a row, but it was very silently. Um, yeah, I helped two of those three groups that Brother Xavier talked about. Men who are verbal cowards, and men who have poor social skills and, and verbal communication skills. Now, the one brothers I can't really help, if you're a guy, I've always said, Mo One is not designed to help men prevent rejection, delay rejection, or minimize the egotistical sting of rejection. So I always lay that out up front. I'm not in business to help men, offer men any type of guarantee any type of guarantee that I can help them prevent rejection, delay rejection, or minimize the egotistical sting of rejection. I just help men better accept and become unfazed by the rejection that they do experience. 
It's just like I always compare it to being a baseball player. Most, in order to be a top-notch home run hitter, you have to be a baseball player who is unfazed by the idea of striking out, period. It's like if you're a baseball player and your aspiration is to be a top-notch home run hitter, but you're very fearful of striking out or you allow striking out to significantly bother you, you'll never be a top home run hitter. Because most of the home run hitters in the league, in Major League Baseball, are also the, the leaders of the league in strikeouts. That's just a fact. Like Michael Jordan said in an infamous, uh, I shouldn't say infamous, a famous commercial he did, a real well done commercial he said. Michael Jordan basically talked about how even though he's remembered for a lot of his game winning shots, he basically said in this commercial that he missed more game winning shots than he than he uh, successfully hit. But he said, the reason why I'm successful is because I'm not scared to take that game winning shot, even if it might miss. Oh, you brothers out here. Yeah, man, I remember, man, going back to, also going back to college days. See, when I was in college, there was two types of brothers. There's two types of brothers. And I would say probably to this day, there's these two types of brothers. There were some brothers who didn't really care for black women. But they showed it more through their actions than their words. They showed it more through their actions than their words. Like I knew at least a handful of brothers on uh, on the campus of any university when I was in college. You just always saw them with white women. You never saw them with black women. Now, I, ne I would never hear these brothers disparage black women. They would never say anything negative about black women. They just, you just never saw them with black women. They, you know, so I would put them in the category of actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Like, there were a lot of athletes like that. There were a lot of athletes like that. There are a lot of black, I would say no less than probably one third of the black athletes on campus, they didn't mess around with black women. But you would never hear them dogging out black women. They just wouldn't mess around with them. They, you would always see them with a white woman. Yeah, you wouldn't see them messing around with uh, black women, but they wouldn't like be whining and complaining about black women. Then there was that other group I've already mentioned that there was always this small percentage of brothers on campus, man. Anytime I was at at the, the the basketball facility playing basketball, you would hear certain brothers sitting on the sidelines dogging out sisters, saying they got too much attitude and they didn't were hard to get along with. And those those brothers were typically brothers who weren't getting no pussy. They weren't getting no pussy. That's who those brothers were. Those brothers were brothers who weren't getting no pussy. They weren't getting no white pussy. <laughs> they weren't getting no black pussy. And they weren't getting no pussy, period. And that's why they were so frustrated. Because they weren't getting no pussy. And I said that on O'Shea's show yesterday. I said, it's only two types of men who do a lot of whining and complaining about women. It's only two types of men who do a lot of whining and complaining about women. And that's men who ain't getting no pussy at all. They ain't had no pussy in the last year, the last two years, last three years, last four years. Or at minimum, men who might be getting a decent amount of pussy, but the quality or caliber of the pussy they're getting is far below their standards. It's far below their standards. Because if a man wants high quality pussy and he's getting high quality pussy, then the logical question is, what does he have to complain about? And I'm dead serious in asking that question. What does he have to complain about? If you desire high quality pussy and you're getting high quality pussy on a regular or semi-regular basis, what do you have to complain about? Honestly, what do you have to complain about? It wouldn't make no sense for you to be on, on YouTube complaining about women. That would make no sense. Y'all need to be real, man. A lot of you brothers need to be real, man. Your social skills ain't up to par. 
Your mouthpiece ain't up to par. Your bedroom skills ain't up to par. Something about your health, fitness, grooming, or fashion style ain't up to par. And probably most profoundly, you got too much negativity in your energy, in your vibe. Everything about your vibe is negative. Women can sense that. Women can sense that. I, as a man, can sense it. I don't like to be around negative people. A lot of times when I'm at social events, in person, I can, I can sense when I'm around a negative person. Just their whole vibe. Their whole see well, my lady, you don't know it. I mentioned this a few times, man. We as human beings, you might not be able to see it with the naked eye, but we all have like a like a what I would call an energy aura around us. We have a certain energy aura around us. Or again, what I like to refer to as a vibe, an energy vibe. Like a lot of people who are into like new age. Um, what's that called? New Age. There's one word I'm missing. Where they talk about like sh chakras and all that type of stuff. Um, New Age. I, I, I almost want to say mysticism, but that's not what I'm talking about. I can't remember. But um, yeah, you 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 probably run across podcasts where people be talking about stuff like energy fields and chakras and all that type of stuff, uh, tantric energy. Um, yeah, man, we all have a certain energy, man. And at different moments in time, man, your energy can either be positive or it could be negative. It could be loving. Or it could be hateful. It could be forgiving or it could be unforgiving. It could be empathetic or it could be unempathetic. Everybody gives off energy. If you remember that story I told a couple of YouTube videos about this woman, I remember I had a conversation with on one of my episodes of my blog talk radio show. I'm going to tell it for probably the third time, but there was a woman who called into my show and at first she was lightheartedly trying to give me some 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 problems. She's called herself criticizing me. And within minutes, I had her, you know, having love for the king, King Alan Roger Curry. Anyway, we ended up talking a couple days later uh, privately. And she made this comment. She said, Alan, she said, you're misleading a lot of your clients and followers. And I said, how so? She said, because you're making your clients and followers believe that they can just go up to a woman and say X, Y, Z, and they'll just all of a sudden magically have these women in bed. She said, that's not true. And I said, well, I've never told a man that he could ever magically have any woman in bed just by saying X, Y, Z. But continue to elaborate. And anyway, when I get in a long story, she basically said, she said, I can tell just from talking to you on the phone that, Alan, you know how to read women. And didn't I talk about that like in just in the last week or two in one of my videos? I can't remember which video, but I was talking about my ability to read women. Really, I said I can read both men and women. But that's this, this, what was amazing about this woman saying that is that she hadn't even met me in person. Most people who say that about me are people who met me in person. But she could tell just from interacting with me on the phone. She said, Alan, I can tell you know how to read women real well. She said, because that's what you did with me. When I called into your show, you did not react to me or respond to me immediately. What you did was you paid attention to my verbal energy. You paid attention to my vocal energy the vibrations that my verbal energy was giving you. And then once you sized me up, then you reacted and responded to
to the things I said. And I said, damn, that's pretty perceptive on your part. But it was the truth. Which everything she was saying was actually the truth. Because that is what I do with women. Then I, again, I said this on a recent video. I said the two most things when I'm in a person's presence that I evaluate them on is the way they use their eyes and the way they use their voice. That's the two most things I evaluate people on is their eyes and their voice. Their eyes and their voice. Not only would I say that's true of women, but even men. When I interact with men, when I first meet a man, that's the two most things I pay attention to is how he uses his eyes and how he uses his voice. Because you can generally tell, man, people who are full of shit by the way they use their eyes and their voice. And that's real talk. You can, for a guy like me, I can quickly distinguish between real, authentic, genuine people versus phony, two-faced, full of shit type people just by their eyes and their voice. Just by their eyes and their voice. That's a skill some of you, you men, and particularly you black men, need to acquire. Now, before I go, I'm going to tell one more story, and I'm going to put the link in my comments section. But as you all know, I have an adults-only podcast program called The Erotic Conversationalist. The erotic, Like, a lot of the women, if you're on my Facebook page, in social media in general, you see women refer to me as King Allen or Sir. It's typically because of one or two reasons. That's because that woman either is a current or former BDSM client of mine. As you know, I'm a BDSM dom and I'm a BDSM advisor and consultant for men, women, and couples, both married and unmarried couples. So that... Women who are BDSM clients of mine tend to refer to me as King Allen or Sir. Or women who are fans of my show, The Erotic Conversationalist. I have a lot of women, a lot of black women, but women in general, but a, a good percentage of them are black women. I have a lot. Of, matter of fact, I would estimate that probably 90% of the people who listen to the, my episodes of The Erotic Conversationalist are women. Like, at least if I was basing it on feedback, like 90 to 95% of the feedback I get from my show, The Erotic Conversation, is, is from women. Women love that show, if I say so myself. Women love my show, The Erotic Conversations. But I would tell this one story, one of my guests, that just demonstrates how the difference between me and a lot of black men. There was a woman I interviewed named Brandy. Brandy. And again, I'll put the link. In, in the comment section. I first came across Brandy on, believe it, this is going to date myself, MySpace. Do any of you all remember when MySpace was popular? <laughs> Before Facebook became popular, the most popular social media site was a site called MySpace. MySpace. Everybody used to be on MySpace. I was on there from roughly 2004 until about 2008, I was on MySpace. Yeah, I was on MySpace from 2004 to 2008. And then I want to say, starting with November or December of 2008, that's when I got on Facebook. That's when I started using Facebook. But, um... Yeah, so me and Brandy, we first met on Facebook and we exchanged a couple of messages. And so then once we got on Facebook, then we got on Facebook together. And I told her one time on Facebook, I wrote a message. I said, you got a sexy ass body. I said, I want to fuck the shit out of you. But before that day comes, I want to listen to you play with your pussy for me over the phone. Man, she went the fuck off on me. <laughs> she went the fuck off on me, man. But what do I always say? What do I always say? What advice do I give you, man? I always say, 
You cannot take a lot of negative reactions from women on face value. Don't I always say that? You cannot take a lot of negative reactions from women on face value. She went the fuck off on me. She called me all kinds of asshole, jerk. I don't want to even say she even called me a pervert. She called me all that shit, man. Then I want to say the next day or two days later, she unfriended me on Facebook. She unfriended me. And I was like, okay. So I left her alone. I left her alone. Never tried to, you know, write her no more, talk to her no more. Now fast forward about two years later. So it didn't happen overnight. The change in her reaction towards me didn't happen overnight. Yeah, it, I left alone for about a, a minimum a year and a half, if not two years later. And then some other woman who I was Facebook friends with was talking about me on her Facebook timeline. She was saying stuff like, Alan Roger Curry, I think she was talking about the erotic conversation. She said, has anybody heard Alan Roger Curry's show, the erotic conversation? God, he is so nasty and he's so kinky. God, girl, he, he be getting me wet. He is nasty, kinky. He be getting me wet listening to that show. And of all the people on her timeline who responded, guess who responded? Brandy. I saw Brandy respond. She said, Alan Roger Curry, I know him. He tried to have phone sex with me one time. He tried to have phone sex with me one time. He, he, yeah, he's a trip. He's a trip. So once I saw her write that, I wrote her and I said, you know you want to play with your pussy for me. And you know you want me to fuck you. But guess how her reaction was this time? L-O-L. L-O-L. See the difference in reaction? First time she called me an asshole, jerk, pervert. Now two years later, her reaction was L-O-L. So without getting into a longer story, what I ended up telling her, she ended up basically telling me, she said, yeah, now I'm willing to play with my pussy for you. I said, no, can't do it privately. You're going to have to do it publicly. She said, are you serious? I said, yeah. I said, the only way I'm going to let you play with your pussy for me now is if you do it publicly on my show, The Erotic Conversations. Otherwise, I'm not going to let you play with your pussy for me. She said, you're serious. I said, yeah, I'm damn serious. The rest is history. <laughs> listen to the episode for yourself. Matter of fact, if you listen at the beginning of that episode, you're going to hear her give me an apology for how she treated me initially, how she called me an ass or a jerk. I made her apologize at the beginning of, of, the, of the interview. Mo one, baby. Mo one, baby. Quit all that whining and complaining and go out and make some shit happen. Put all that whining and complaining. I'm talking primarily to you black men and beyond that, I'm talking to you men, period. Quit all that whining and complaining. Calling women bitches and shit. You don't want your dick sucked? You don't want to fuck? You just want to spend your whole life complaining about bitches? How I many? For you guys who are in your 20s or early to mid 30s, you want to be 40 years old, 45 years old? 50 years old, 60 years old, doing nothing but whining and complaining about women's behavior? Is that the life you really want to create for yourself? I mean, seriously, is it? Do you want to be a 50-year-old brother on YouTube complaining about women instead of enjoying women romantically and sexually? Is that what you want to do? That ain't what you want to do. Patreon exclusive live stream today, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I call, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yeah. 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 Oh. 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 You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the 
king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice, how seductive your intonations are, the vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice, how you could make her pussy so wet just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king. 